Roy Bannister is the CEO of Particle Health, a company that is shaping the new standard for healthcare data exchange with a user-friendly application programming interface platform, or API as they call it. After spending years in the healthcare industry as an EMT, clinical researcher, and a medical student at one point, he decided to attempt the seemingly insurmountable task of fixing the interoperability problem of the electronic medical records. Protocol Health gives application designers and therefore patients through those applications access to their records and ways to use them. You'll get a better understanding of when he explains it. So we talk mostly about how he came up with the idea for Particle Health, the precedent in the financial industry, the example being Venmo, which most of us use, how the interface works, and why blockchain actually isn't necessary for the portability and security. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. And now a word from this week's sponsor, Laurel Road. Buying a home like the one I grew up in has been my dream. We had this great yard where my brother and I would run under the sprinklers. We had a big kitchen table where I told my parents I got into med school. Now I'm a member of Laurel Road for Doctors, where I got a great rate on a physician mortgage and was eligible for no money down and no PMI, so I can make new memories in my own home. Laurel Road for Doctors. Banking insights and benefits uniquely designed for doctors. See laurelroad.com slash doctor home for full terms and conditions. Laurel Road is a brand of KeyBank NA and Equal Housing Lender. NMLS 399797. Troy Bannister, thanks so much for coming to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So tell us your origin story. What is the particle health or I guess even the Troy Bannister origin story? Yeah, uh, two, two are the same. Um, been in healthcare my whole life. Uh, when I was e uh, 18, I decided to become an EMT. Um, started working in ambulance through college on weekends and breaks and summers. Totally fell in love with medicine doing that. Um, ended up switching to pre-med, went out to Georgetown for uh, my first year of med school and absolutely hated it. Um, ended up leaving. Got hold on, hold on. Yeah. What year were you there? I was there 2012. I was there as well, 2012. Were I you? Did, oh, no, no, man, crap. No, I did residency there from 2006 to 2011. So just missed. Okay. Just missed. All right. Just missed. So was there 2012, um, you're probably familiar with the SMP program then perhaps. Yeah. Uh, so I did that. Um, after that, I decided I didn't want to go forward. Um, and so I ended up getting, taking the master's degree. I um, came to New York. I was doing clinical research for a couple of years at Mount Sinai. Um, got kind of pulled into the digital health side of things back then, which was pretty nascent at the time. And thought, hey, you know, the cell phone and the internet are not used as well as they could be in, in the healthcare world. And so I joined a, a small venture capital firm called Startup Health out here in New York. Um, we were investing in very early stage digital health companies, like two to five people um, size companies. And I just recognized this huge issue, uh, which was that no matter where I was in the ambulance or the hospital or working with entrepreneurs, nobody had access to medical data at, in a really good way. And when I looked at other industries, I saw companies like Plaid in the finance space or Twilio in the communication space. And thought, hey, why is there no API company or data um, aggregation company that works really well for, for other folks um, in the healthcare space? And so I decided to start Particle. Sorry, Plaid. And I, yeah. I think if you explain what Plaid is, it's going to help our listeners understand a little better how you came up with this idea. Because yeah. me, as a physician, look at the fact that there's no interoperability between EMRs as an insurmountable task. Yes. Right? Not something that I could ever consider fixing. And you were like, mm, I think I can fix that problem. Yeah, we think we can fix it. Um, it you've probably used Plaid before. Um, if you've ever used Venmo or Mint or Robinhood or ever bought crypto in your life. Uh, no, I've done none of those things. My <laughs> wife is the one that does the Venmoing in our relationship. You must have I said used I'm 43. <laughs> I don't Venmo. <laughs> you've never Venmo. Never. So, never. so funny. Every time I Venmo I by proxy. This, I, I use Venmo all the time as an example, and I've never run into somebody that's like, no, I've never done it. Nope. <laughs> so this is my first time doing that. Uh, Venmo is the app that you send $5 from your bank to $5 of your friend's bank. It's super, super easy to do. You can do it with your phone number and their phone number, basically. It's as easy as it could be. And behind Venmo is a company called Plaid. Plaid's done all the hard work of connecting into every bank in the United States and consolidating that all down to a single developer platform. 
so that Venmo could be built. It took the developers to build Venmo a very short amount of time because Plaid had already done all the legwork of making these connections and standardizing the information and the exchange of, of that data. So in a, in a similar way to healthcare, we connect to all the practices, clinics, hospitals, labs, pharmacies in the US, and we have a single entry point for developers to come and build things on top of, very similar to the way Plaid supported a company like Venmo. But Plaid is pulling in numbers. Like you have this much money in this account. Like that's a pretty basic piece of information as opposed to like a cat scan. Like, and so when you're as a, as, as a programmer, I guess, is that what you would call yourself? Uh, definitely not me. Not a programmer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, the CEO of a tech company, um, sure. when you're, when you're thinking about that, do you think like, well, when Plaid did it, it's just numbers, which are, you know, ones and zeros in computer language. And if we're getting a cat scan, it's just ones and zeros in computer, computer language. They're just a lot more of them. Uh, yes and no. Um, I think if you dig deep into Plaid, it's a series of transactions and information about those transactions, um, where the purchase occurred, how much it cost on the date of the, the purchase. Um, there's probably inform meta information about what bank went to what systems. There's a lot of stuff that goes behind the scenes that's important. Um, I do agree with you that the healthcare data is much more robust and complicated. Um, when you're creating a, the representation of a person's health in, in data format, it's, it's a complicated system. Um, you, maybe you're familiar with FHIR, the Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resource Standard. No, and let's assume no. the listeners aren't either. So FHIR is a new data standard. And I say new, it's like probably seven years old, but it's the first time the healthcare industry ever agreed on saying, this is how we're gonna store data. We're gonna store it the same way as everybody else. Epic, Cerner, Allscripts, NextGen, they all use Fire now. And so it used to be like, uh, back in the day, it was mumps, I believe, was the way that they stored data, which is an old school, like 80s, 70s way of storing data. And nobody used the same standards. So if you wanted to send a record from an Epic site to a Cerner site, it would not be able to ingest and use that information and display it in the EMR. But now that everybody's on Fire, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, pun. Um, you can easily send a record from one place to another. And so there's been a lot of work that's gone on behind the scenes to, to get everybody to use the same standardized way of representing um, records. Um, Wait, but isn't so, that what you guys are doing? It sounds like, so, I thought the, yeah, I thought that was the idea of you were solving the problem of interoperability, but hasn't Fire done that? It's a piece of the puzzle. Um, the biggest problem of interoperability is not the data standardization or anything, it's the, the willingness to play along. Um, all the stakeholders do not want to share data. And for example, and actually I'd be very curious to hear you think about this. I don't know if you know about like the anti-information blocking rules that passed under the 21st Century Cures Act. Um, basically saying consumers have the right to their own data. Oh yeah, um, we're all, all physicians now are very aware of that because they'll get their CAT scan results before we do, or they'll get sure. their lab results before we do. And then they don't know what to do with that information. So it's, it's right. a double-edged sword. Good. We want them to have access. We certainly don't want to lock them out of their own data, but at the same time, if they're unable to know what to do with it, it it's going to lead to a lot of problems as well. Agreed. So that's, that's an interesting piece of this puzzle. Um, when the data is standardized, the data can be exchanged and there's legal precedent to share that data with consumers directly. That's interoperability. You need all those things lined up together. The technology, the data standardization, the legal implications. There's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons not to share data. There's probably more reasons not to share data than to share data, but it violates some fundamental rights that people have to access something that they technically own. And so that's kind of the challenging piece, but um, I, we're kind of going down a rabbit hole a little bit. Um, it's fine. It's mostly, it's it's, let's, let's keep going. It's mostly the incentive piece that's stopped interoperability in the past. The different stakeholders do not want to share the data and the consumers want access to their data. And that misalignment has been really hard to solve for. Yeah. Why would they solve? They don't have the incentive to do it because they're not selling because the patient isn't their consumer. Correct. Like if you're Epic, if you're Cerner, the hospital, the big medical practice, they're your consumer, not the patient. So right. they're not selling it to you. They're selling it to, so yeah. And then the doctor, your 
client is the patient. So your customer is the patient. So yeah, that, that, yeah. that, that makes sense why it didn't exist there before. And what you're saying is we have a way to take using fire, using this international language of electronic medical records, we're going to then make the information accessible to the patients. But wait a second, <laughs> we already have patient portals. Mm -hmm. We have patient portals. Patients already have access to the, their own records. I'm sorry, Troy, you missed the boat on that. <laughs> not going to work. I wish, I wish that was true. Um, so yes, there are patient portals, but no, they, they are not leveraged well. And I, I don't think anyone thinks that they're going to be leveraged well in the right way. So for example, um, it works. If, if you ever use Plaid, let's go back to this analogy, um, and you download Venmo from, from the app store and you want to send money to your friend, the first step of using Venmo is log into your bank account. And that's quite easy, right? You log into your bank account at least once a month to pay a bill or check something. Username, password, done. It's logged in. Venmo now has access to your bank and you can move money around. In healthcare, that's a little bit different. If you're a sick person, you probably have five, six, seven different portals that you have to log into to capture your longitudinal record. You cannot request a new password legally online. Or, you have to go. or sorry to interrupt, Troy, yeah, or yeah. you're in one health system and you're locked into that health system because you want all your providers to have access to the same information. So you're going to say, you know what, I need a neurologist, but I'm only going to go to neurology to find, look in system X so that all my doctors are in the same system. And so, so I think actually, where you're going here is, well, you won't have to do that anymore. Yes, you're, you're kind of getting to the main kind of hypothesis behind all of this is that the data being locked up eliminates choice for the consumer. They can't choose what they, how they want to access care, where they want to go, how they want to do it. And the hypothesis behind Particle in the same way that there wasn't with Plaid was, hey, I don't need to go to the bank anymore to send money around. I can go download an app from the App Store and use this tool that was built really, really well for consumers. Or I don't want to go to Merrill Lynch to trade stocks. I want to use Robinhood, app, the app, which gives me way more flexibility. I can buy a tenth of an Amazon share with Robinhood. I can't do that with Merrill Lynch. The innovative side of, of healthcare enterprise is stunted because people don't have choice. There's no money flowing other than the system that they go to. So what if it didn't? What would happen if we could free this information out and allow other organizations and other people to create things that weren't locked up in a health system or built for a health system? That's where it starts to get really interesting. So who are you hoping are gonna be the Venmos, since we keep going <laughs> back to that, that, that app, um, that I've never used. Yeah, yeah. Who are you hoping are going to be the Venmos of Particle? If I knew the answer to that, I'd start another startup right now. Uh, so that's that's the short answer. Um, I think the 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 second answer, which is a little bit better, is I don't think we'll know it until we see it. When Plaid created their platform, there was no such thing as Bitcoin, really, at the time, and they literally were the stepping stone for cryptocurrencies to take off because it was the fastest way for somebody to buy a Bitcoin or an Ethereum or whatever they were buying. We don't know what's going to happen in healthcare, but it's it, the only way that we will find out is enabling this kind of Cambrian explosion of different ideas. And you can't create that Cambrian explosion of ideas unless you reduce the cost significantly to start and create one of those, those solutions. And right now, you have to spend years plugging into hospitals and EMRs and millions of dollars to build that infrastructure so that you can ex access the data before you can start innovating on top of the data. And so just like Plaid did, it eliminated that high cost kind of hurdle. So people could just focus on building Venmo or just focus on building Mint or Robinhood and not worry about building integrations and standardizing data, which just costs and takes so much time to do. So it's really the stepping stone that we're hoping to create. Okay, so I've come up with an idea. Okay, let's do, let, let me get my checkbook. Yeah. So as as an employer, so this isn't on an individual level, but this is on like an employer level. Let's say you're a large organization, right? That sure. employs thousands of people, right? Is there a way to then take their take your and, and you're, they're all on your health insurance, right? To get access to their information, but without their personal information. So like, let's say 
I find out that only 10% of my staff is getting their flu shot and that, you know, we, ha we have to pay for X number of hospital admissions for pneumonia. And we know that flu shots decrease your risk of getting pneumonia. So because I don't want premiums to go up and the cost of healthcare to go up, I'm now going to offer an incentive for my staff to get flu shots. Great. hundred bucks for any flu shot. I did the math. If, if this works exactly. out, we're going to actually save a bunch of money. So is, is that something that will be applicable or is this really just for individual patients to use their own data? No, you, you nailed it. That's exactly the type of thing that we support. Even today, we don't work directly with employers right now. We work with providers, but we enable things very similar to this. Population health, value-based care, predictive analytics, um, care coordination, risk modeling, that's all in the, the bucket. So is there also a, a role for using the data so I'm the, I apologize. The term escapes me where you're taking someone's personal de information out. Sorry, de-identify. De Thank you. Where you're yep. de-identifying the data um, and then use that for research. Yeah, that, this is all on the table in the future for sure. Okay. Yeah. Be because, you know, right now, if you're in like the VA health system, you can, you can de-identify. I mean, I don't know if they actually do this in the VA, but I know it's such an enormous health system that if you were able to de-identify data, you could really run a lot of retrospective studies to try and get some information. It's, it's like a ton of data to be mined. And so what oh, you're yeah. saying is we can now take, you, we can use particle to identify everyone in the US health system and then start mining that data to see what we can figure out. I think it's an extreme statement. And so we would never just run a query on everybody in the United States. <laughs> that would get us in a lot of trouble. But with, with the applicable consents, authorizations, IRBs in place, yeah, you could start doing these types of things. Um, you know, you could even go so far as doing identified research with consent and authorization, right? So like, let's say, let's say a drug is coming to market. It's in phase three. They've done the human trials and it looks good, X, Y, Z. Um, what if instead of running a multi-billion dollar multi-site research prospective study, you just get people's permission and you track, you make it sound so easy. Did they go to the ER? Did they pick up their meds on time? What were their last lab results? And you do that at a scale that allows for unbiased prospective real-time data collection on a group of people that are taking a new drug, like kind of like a post-market surveillance, low cost study. That's like just so easy to do with something like this. Um, and that's kind of what the future looks like, I think. So rather than, so because you'd have access to all of the health systems that they use, like yeah. I, I guess you'd yeah. have to be plugged into, so all of them would need to be participating. So we are plugged systems. into, we are plugged into um, about 90% of the EMRs. We have access to about 300 million people's medical records. Um, the way the API works, just so you know, you just put in someone's name, date of birth, address, phone number, that's it. And we can go find all their medical records from around the United States. We have about a 90% success rate in finding all your records. And we find about 105 records per patient per search uh, wow. on average. So we're, we're plugged into most of the, the endpoints now. So when you say they're medical records. Yeah. What does that mean? Because for some of the listeners that are closer to my age, you might remember a, a, a YouTube skit. I think it might have been done at like the graduating medical school class at Harvard, like 10, 15 years ago, that there was this, they were lampooning outside hospital. Now, right now I am a community attending at outside hospital. So that's, <laughs> this is me. So when you transfer patient from outside hospital to academic hospital, you know, the academic hospital is hoping for CAT scans, MRIs, and lab results, and maybe a summary of mm -hmm. what's been going on with the patient up till now. But we used to get that with a stack of like 100 pages of yeah. vitals and nursing notes of like transferred the patient. And, you know, so, so how do we tease out or how do yeah. you help yeah. the user to tease out the usable useful data from the not so useful data so you're you're right i think 
our the first mission at Particle is can we put in someone's name and get all their medical records? And we've basically done that at this point. The second mission that we're on right now is okay, we just got a ton of information about Bob Smith. What does the clinician need to know right now in this moment? And so this is actually where fire comes in, this fast healthcare interoperability resource, the way that the data we the, so we take all the records and we actually break it into pieces and we organize it in a way that is chronological by encounter and by condition. And so if we are working with a diabetes specialist, we can pull out a longitudinal view of only diabetes related information. Maybe it's A1C values, maybe it's glomerular filtration rates, maybe it's blood pressure uh, readings over time. We can kind of tease out things based on ICD-10 codes, based on LOINC codes, based on SNOMED codes that indicate this is relevant to this encounter that's about to happen. So we, we can curate information out in a timely way that kind of cuts out all the other stuff. There's also, we also get all the open text doctor's notes and stuff too, which you can't really break into tiny pieces very easily, or you miss context and you, you know, kind of ruin the whole point of them. So we get all that stuff on the side as well. Um, but as long as it's, um, it's a quantitative value, we can break it into pieces. Yeah. There's probably going to be some problem with the longitudinal of like a physical exam. On this one, the patient didn't have a thyroid. They had a thyroidectomy scar. And then following day, they had their thyroid. And the next day it was gone again with a thyroidectomy scar. What what happened in this interval? It was just, you know, clicked on the wrong template or yes. whatever it was. Didn't carry this, forward comments. And, this you know, all those certainly types. happens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but ultimately you particle isn't the interface. Particle isn't the one that we're going to be interfacing with. It's going to be an app that's built on particle. So they whoever the the programmer is needs to make sure that labs are easy to find, scans are easy to find, whatever it is, they need to make the interface user-friendly. Unlike, unfortunately, a lot of the EMRs out there. Yeah, I, I would say um, our data pops up mostly in EMRs. Uh, most of our customers use EMRs, whether they bought it off the shelf or built their own version of an EMR. Um, and then there's an increasing amount of like pure applications too, on top of that. So who'd you get, have to get permission from? You have to get to, to pull the, the data. Is it the EMR or the hospital? Uh, wow, this is actually a relatively complicated question. <laughs> so um, the, there are nonprofit government sponsored organizations that are promoting interoperability. And an example of one of these groups is, a, is an organization called Care Quality that you probably have never heard of before. Um, it's run by a group called the Sequoia Project, which is run by um, the Office of the National Coordinator of Health, which is run by HHS. And so it's, which, which is mandated by the White House to do things. And so it's, it's, a, it's a nonprofit government organization that's basically saying, we're gonna do the work of creating policy that allows for groups like Particle to connect with the EMRs. And so it's actually through that group that we've certified. And by certifying through that group, we have access to the EMRs and can exchange data with the EMRs. So with things like anti-information blocking and a rule you might not have heard of called TEFCA, which is coming out in the next six months, um, stands for the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement, which is establishing a national infrastructure for data exchange in a, in a more solidified fashion. Um, those rules coming from the government are creating policies that allow private organizations to build infrastructure, infrastructure that allows for the transaction of data across different organizations that don't necessarily want to share it. So this is this is what what was intended was it like 15 years ago when they yeah. mandated that that hospitals and doctors offices get on EMR except this yeah. wasn't really it, there this wasn't there at the time they hadn't this thought of a, this. right so it was like, the high tech act was a bit of a blunder uh, yeah. HIPAA was a bit of a blunder and so this is kind of a way to go back and sweep up the pieces that were missed in those rules so is there is there an, another example of an app that would be patient facing right where the patients are the ones downloading their app because the only thing that comes to mind for me who's very short-sighted is something that the patient would come to me the doctor and say here's all my medical records and then they like app like in an apple pay kind of a way like mm -hmm. swipe it by my check-in station 
And now mm -hmm. I have the most up-to-date medical information for them. But that's still not really for the patients. It's still for me to allow me to help the patient. So is there anything out there that you were or someone has come to you with where it's an example of an app that a patient would have on their phone or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Um, I, I think kind of what you mentioned is definitely the number one thing we see today, which is not that creative of an idea, right? Well, it, thanks. <laughs> anytime. Um, it's, it's often referred to as a PHR, personal health record, which is like an app you can download that houses all your data and can show you graphs and whatnot about your health. Not a ton of value for the individual. Maybe if you're a chronically ill person or have a rare disease, it can be helpful to have that on your phone and share it with a specialist as you bop around different providers. That's really valuable to a lot of people. But for the general population, it's not the most valuable thing. Where it starts to get interesting and, and frankly, just doesn't exist today because there's no easy way to get your records into a single application um, would be something that would maybe perhaps help you identify the best insurance plan to choose based on your health or the best providers in your area that have really good quality scores. Um, ooh, 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 best providers. That, that gets a little dicey in those measures. Sure. You know? It does. It, maybe we're not going off HEDIS or STAR, but you know something relevant to the disease profile that you have as an individual. Um, there's a lot of kind of like, let me help you make consumer-based deci decisions in the healthcare space that people just have a really hard time making today because they don't really have to base it off of anything. They don't really know how to base it. Um, so these are types of things. That's interesting. That, the, the health insurance one is is an interesting one because as people are making their decisions right now, they're more, you know, they they really can't anticipate what it really means, right? If they have a high deductible plan, then there's they're like, oh, great, I'm a healthy person. I am like, I'd rather have the lowest premiums, so I'm going to do that. And then anytime they go to the doctor, they don't recognize how much it's really going to cost because they're deductible. Um, and, and totally. you know, the same in the other regard, maybe they're just someone who's risk averse. And so they're going to pay for the low deductible plan just in case. And it's a terrible decision for them because they <sighs> never need to go to the doctor. Yeah. I mean, it, once you get down into the, the fine print of these, these policies as well, it's like, yeah, we'll cover, you know, 80% of your gastroenterologist visit, but 20% of a podiatrist. Right. Like there's there's very there's a wide variety of what things will be covered. Why? And maybe based on me, who's part Ashkenazi Jew, uh, needs a GI doctor more than a podiatrist, just based on who I am and my profile as a as a person um, that I don't think about when I choose these these types of policies, but could be important and, and smart for me to do. So I, it's it's tough, um, but. There's tons of room for innovation on top of the medical records today that just are, are stagnant. Um, yeah, and given for those of us, uh, those of you out there who are watching the YouTube channel instead of listening to the podcast and you see our complexions, dermatology, <laughs> both Troy and I would definitely need a, a plan that covers dermatology. Yeah, yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. What about blockchain? Because mm. because there's um, there's a lot of talk of blockchain in healthcare because it's a way to keep everything secure, right? Like I want my health information to be secure. There's a, there's a physician out there who's telling us that it's a great way for me to keep all of my credentialing information in the same place because if I I have it on the blockchain, I can just you know when I, if I want to have privileges at Mount Sinai right now, I'm at NYU Long Island. All I do is I take my credentials in the blockchain format and give it to Mount Sinai. Um, so this interoperability of credentialing, like this is this is their business model. And so it made me think like, well, that could also work for personal health information. What are your thoughts on, I mean, from what you're describing, it doesn't sound like, it sounds like blockchain is, is like an unnecessary step in there. It's unnecessarily complicated. We don't need to do that for security reasons. Like that was the big sell is for security reasons, we're going to need to do, have to do that. Uh, so what are I your think, thoughts about blockchain? I think you, you kind of hit my opinion here. I, I think it's unnecessary, frankly. Um, I think theoretically, blockchain is an excellent technology that is 
as close to perfect as we can get to security, to anonymity, to storage, distributed storage, de democratization of these things. It, it's a perfect, it's as close to perfect as you can get today using technology to do these things. It's just not necessary. <laughs> it just isn't. This is why we have rules and regulations. This is why we have really high security requirements in the healthcare space. Things like SOC 2 and high trust, if you're familiar with these uh, security um, uh, uh, credentials that, that groups like us have to get in order to sell to any organization that's serious. Um, takes almost a year to get high trust of nonstop full-time work. Um, there's a ton of security compliance. In fact, we delete every record we ever transact, just to be sure. Just delete it. We are not in the business of storing the data and being a vulnerable place to be hacked. And so if you're a real healthcare company and you're, and you're playing it smart, um, blockchain is just not necessary. It's just, it's really complicated and very expensive to maintain and does not give you anything more than a bit of marginal value on top. Because it seems like the, the trade-off of accessibility is privacy. Right, you're losing some privacy by having accessibility, and what you're saying is the accessibility is not like it's ultimately the EMRs that are the gatekeepers, and they are still they are still the gatekeepers. Well, actually, it's actually the providers. The providers are the gatekeepers. <gasps> yeah. So, so here's an interesting fact for you: um, the enter information blocking rule that says consumers have the right to access their data through technically feasible ways is in law right now. It's enforceable. And yet every request we've ever made for on behalf of a consumer to request their own record has been denied by the providers. We've run hundreds of them, if not more. Providers will not share data directly back with consumers, even in this, in, with the rule in place today. Now, the caveat is it may be enforceable, but the fines have not been set yet or been distributed yet. October 6th of this year, the Office of Civil Rights is capable of issuing fines up to a million dollars per infraction for info blocking. Cool. So what happens is like, let's say we have an app as a customer and you download this app on the app store. You're like, I want to pull my medical records into this app. So the app sends particle or request for your records. We send it out across the network. We hit Epic and Cerner and all scripts and Athena health and Meditech and next gen, all these groups. They pass it down to their provider organizations and the providers decide I will respond or I will not respond. That's where the buck stops today. The EMRs are passing these requests down to the providers and they're saying, do you want to respond? And of course, this is all happening like electronically, like, you know, it's automated, but the providers today do not respond. They just would rather not give the data back to the consumer. Unless there's Esquire after the name, in which case then, uh, yeah. That's, that's been our, that's been most of our experiences though. Like whenever someone's yeah. requesting data, it's usually a lawyer and <laughs> I will complain about this to the end of time. You never know whether the person's just like claiming disability. So they need their medical records or they're suing you. So I never know whether it's like someone who's coming after me or they just want their records for their own reason. But either way, yeah. yes, we should be, yeah. they are still their records. They're owned by them and, and we, and we should be sending them to them. Yeah, so, so it's interesting. Okay, so this is a physician-facing podcast. That's my audience. My audience is physicians. Why did you want to come? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Why did you want to come on the podcast on a podcast that's physician-facing? Because it seems like, you know, the next step for you would be, you know, raising another round of funds and hiring more developers and growing it and you know, looking for some some finance people. Why is it that you wanted to talk to physicians? Well, I mean, first of all, we just closed our last round of financing. So the money's in the bank. And so we are hiring and we are building and we are making what we have better. Um, the most important thing for me though, as the, as the CEO is providers are our end users, right? They're the ones that are at the end of the day, looking at the data that we get them that help them make clinical decisions about the patients that sit, are sitting in front of them, either it's digitally, virtually, or in person. And so, I mean, my, my whole dream here is that providers are breaking down the doors at their organization saying, why don't I get a clean view of my patient's historical medical records? Like I, I as a provider want and need context around the patient to provide the best possible care I can. And I want to be that solution for them. I want them to be like, I want to know the medications my patients are on. I want to know the lab results from last week at the doctor across the street. Um, I want to know 
you know, the comorbidities of the patient before they walk in the room. And that's what we do. And so I want to kind of, I want to get the word out to the providers or who are the ones at the end of the day that are using Particle. And so where can we find Particle and where can we find you? Uh, you can find me in Brooklyn walking around uh, North, uh, North Greenpoint. Um, or you go to our website, ParticleHealth.com and pick, click around. Um, super easy to get in touch with us through the website. There's a contact us form or um, you can just shoot me a message on LinkedIn. My name's Troy Bannister or just search Particle Health and find me. Troy Bannister, Particle Health, amazing stuff you're doing. Thanks so much for all your work and for your time. Thank you. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.